Chapter Five of High Adventure: A Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. High Adventure: A Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. Chapter Five. Our First Patrol. We got down from the train late in the afternoon at a village which reminded us, at first glance, of a boom town in the far west. Crude shelters of corrugated iron and rough pine boards faced each other down the length of one long street. They looked sadly out of place in the landscape. They did not have the cheery, buoyant ugliness of pioneer homes in an unsettled country, for behind them were the ruins of the old village, fragments of blackened wall stone chimneys filled with accumulation of rubbish, garden plots choked with weeds, reminding us that here was no outpost of a new civilization, but the desolation of an old one, fallen upon evil days. A large crowd of pernicioniers had left the train with us. We were not at ease among these men, many of them well along in middle life, bent and streaming with perspiration under their heavy packs. We were much better able than most of them to carry our belongings to endure the fatigue of a long night march to billets or trenches, and we were waiting for the motor, in which we should ride comfortably to our aerodrome. There we should sleep in beds, well housed from the weather, and far out of the range of shell-fire. "'It isn't fair,' said J. B. "'It is going toward Deluxe. These old police ought to be the aviators.' But hang it all, of course, they couldn't be. Aviation is a young man's business. It was to be that way, and you can't have aerodromes along the front-line trenches. Nevertheless, it did seem very unfair, and we were uncomfortable among all those infantrymen. The feeling increased when attention was called to our branch of the service by the distant booming of anti-aircraft guns. There were shouts in the street, A Bosch! We hurried to the door of the café, where we had been hiding. Officers were ordering the crowds off the street. Hurry along there, under cover. Oh, I know that you're brave enough, mon enfant. It isn't that. He's not to see all these soldiers here. That's the reason. Allez vous. Soldiers were going into dugouts and cellars among the ruined houses. Some of them, seeing us at the door of the café, made pointed remarks as they passed, grumbling loudly at the laxity of the air service. It's up there you ought to be, mon Vuix, not here, one of them said, pointing to the white echelonments. You see that, said another. He's a Bosch, not French. I can tell you that. Where are your comrades? There was much good-natured chaffing as well, but through it all I could detect a note of resentment. I sympathized with their point of view then as I do now, although I know that there is no ground for the complaint of laxity. Here is a German over French territory. Where are the French aviators? Soldiers forget that aerial frontiers must be guarded in two dimensions, and that it is always possible for an airman to penetrate far into enemy country. They do not see their own pilots on their long raids into German territory. Furthermore, while the outward journey is often accomplished easy enough, the return home is a different matter. Telephones are busy from the moment lines are crossed, and a hostile patrol, to say nothing of a lone avion, will be fortunate if he returns safely. But infantrymen are to be forgiven readily for their outbursts against the aviation service. They have far more than their share of danger and death while in the trenches. To have their brief periods of rest behind the lines broken into by enemy aircraft, who would blame them for complaining? and they are often generous enough with their praise. On this occasion there was no bombing. The German remained at a great height and quickly turned northward again. Dunham and Miller came to greet us. We had all four been in schools together, they preceding us on active service only a couple of months. Seeing them after this lapse of time, I was conscious of a change. They were keen about life at the front but they talked of their experiences in a way which gave one a feeling of tension, a tautness of muscles, a kind of ache in the throat. It set me to thinking of a conversation I had had with an old French pilot. 
several months before. It came apropos of nothing. Perhaps he thought that I was sizing him up, wondering how he could be content with an instructor job while the war is in progress. He said, I had five hundred hours over the lines. You don't know what that means, not yet. I'm no good any more. It's drain. Let me give you some advice. Save your nervous energy. You will need all you have and more. Above everything else, I don't think at the front. The best pilot is the best machine. Dunham was talking about patrols. To a day of two hours each. Occasionally you will have six hours flying, but almost never more than that. What about voluntary patrols, Drew asked? I don't suppose there is any objection, is there? Miller pounded Dunham on the back, singing, Hoodie, hoodie, dum die. What did I tell you? Do I win? Then he explained. We asked the same question when we came out, and every other new pilot before us. This voluntary patrol business is kind of a standing joke. You think now that four hours a day over the lines is a light program. For the first month or so, you will go out on your own between times. After that, no. Of course, when they call for a voluntary patrol for some necessary piece of work, you will volunteer out of a sense of duty. As I say, you may do as much flying as you like, but wait. After a month, or we'll give you six weeks, that will be no more than you have to do. We were not at all convinced. What do you do with the rest of your time? Sleep, said Dunham. Read a good deal. Play some poker or bridge. Walk. But sleep is the chief amusement. Eight hours used to be enough for me. Now I can do with ten or twelve. Drew said, It's all rot. You fellows are having it too soft. They ought to put you on the school regime again. Let them talk, Dunham. They know J.B. says it's laziness. Let it go at that. Well, take it from me. It's contagious. You'll soon be victims. I dropped out of the conversation in order to look around me. Drew did all the questioning, and thanks to his interest, I got many hints about our work, which came back opportunely afterward. Think down to the gunners. That will help a lot. It's a game after that. Your skill against theirs. I couldn't do it at first, and shell fire seemed absolutely damnable. And you want to remember that a chase machine is almost never brought down by anti-aircraft fire. You're too fast for them. You can fool them in a thousand ways. I had been flying for two weeks before I saw Bosch. They were not scarce on this sector. Don't worry. I simply couldn't see them. The others would have scraps. I spent most of my time trying to keep track of them. Take my tip, J.B. Don't be too anxious to mix it up with the first German you see, because very likely he will be a Frenchman. And if he isn't, if he is a good Hun pilot, you'll simply be meat for him. At first, I mean. They say that all Bosch aviators on this front have had several months' experience in Russia or the Balkans. They train them there before they send them to the Western Front. Your best chance of being brought down will come in the first two weeks. That's comforting. No, sans blague. Honestly, you'll be almost helpless. You don't see anything, and you don't know what it is that you do see. Here's an example. On one of my first sorties, I happened to look over my shoulder and saw five or six Germans in the most beautiful alignment, and they were all slanting up to dive on me. I was scared out of my life, went down full motor, then cut and fell, into a rail, came out of that, and had another look. There they were in the same position, only farther away. I didn't tumble even then, except further down. Next time I looked, the five Boches, or six, whichever it was, had all been raveled out by the wind. Esclats du abas. You may have heard about Franklin's Bosch. He got hit during his first combat. He didn't know there was a German in the sky until he saw the tracer bullets. Then the machine passed him about thirty meters away, and he kept going down. May have had motor trouble. Franklin said that he had never had such a shock in his life. He dived after him, spraying all space with his vickers, and he got him. That all depends on the man. 
In chase, unless you are sent out on a definite mission, protecting photographic machines or avions de bombardment, you are absolutely on your own. Your job is to patrol the lines. If a man is built that way, he can loaf on the job. He need never have a fight. At two hundred kilometers an hour, it won't take him very long to get out of danger. He stays out his two hours and comes in with some framed-up tale to account for his disappearance. Got lost, went off by himself into Germany, had motor trouble, gun jammed, and went back to arm it. He may even spray a few bullets towards Germany and call it a combat. Oh, he can find plenty of excuses. And he can get away with them. That's spreading at Dunham. What about Houston? Is he getting away with it? Now, don't let's get personal. Very likely, Houston can't help it. Anyway, it is a matter of temperament, mostly. Temperament, hell. There's Van, for example. I happen to know that he has to take himself by his bootlaces every time he crosses into Germany. But he sticks it. He has never played a yellow trick. I hand it to him for Puck above every other man in the squadron. What about Talbot and Barry? Lord, they haven't any nerves. It's no job for them to do their work well. This conversation continued until the rest of the journey. The life of a military pilot offers exceptional opportunities for research in the matter of personal bravery. Dunham and Miller agreed that it is a varying quality. Sometimes one is really without fear. At others, only a sense of shame prevents one from making a very sad display. Houston is no worse than some of the rest of us. Only he hasn't a sense of shame. Well, he has the courage to be a coward, and that is more than you have, son, or are I either. Our fellow pilots of the Lafayette Corps were lounging outside the barracks on our arrival. They gave us a welcome which did much to remove our feelings of strangeness, but we knew that they were only mildly interested in the news from the schools and were glad when they let us drop into the background of conversation. By a happy chance, mention was made of a recent newspaper article of some of the exploits of the Escradale, written evidently by a very imaginative journalist. And from this the talk passed to the reputation of the squadron in America, and the almost fabulous deeds credited it to it by some newspaper correspondents. One pilot said that he had kept record of the number of German machines actually reported as having been brought down by members of the Corps. I don't remember the number he gave, but it was an astonishing total. The daily average was so high that, granting it to be correct, America might safely have abandoned her far-reaching aerial program long before her first pursuit squadron could be ready for service. The last of the Imperial German air fleet would, to quote from the article, have crashed in smoldering ruin on the war-devastated plains of northern France. In this connection, I can't forbear quoting from another, one of the brightest pages in the journalistic history of the legendary Escadelle Lafayette. It is an account of a sortie said to have taken place on the receipt of news of America's declaration of war. Uncle Sam is with us, boys. Come on, let's get those fellows. These were the stirring words of Captain George Tenot, the valiant leader of the Escadelle Lafayette upon the morning when news was received that the United States of America had declared war upon rulers of Potsdam. For the first time in history the stars and stripes of old glory were flung to the breeze over the camp in France of American fighting men, inspired by the sight and spurred to instant action by the ringing call of the French captain, this band of aviators from the USA sprang into their trim little biplanes. There was a deafening roar of motors, and soon the last airman had disappeared in the smoky haze which hung over the distant battle lines. We cannot follow them on that journey. We cannot see them as they mount higher and higher into the morning sky on their way to meet their prey, but we may await their return. We may watch them as they descend to their flying field, dropping down to earth one by one. We may learn then of their adventures on that flight of death, of how far back of the German lines they encountered a formidable battle squadron of the enemy, vastly superior to their own numbers. Heedless of the risk, they swooped down upon their foe. Lieutenant A was attacked by four enemy planes at the same time. 
One he sent hurtling to the ground fifteen thousand feet below. He caused a second to retire disabled. Sergeant B accounted for another in a running fight, which lasted for more than a quarter of an hour. Adjutant C, although his biplane was riddled with bullets, succeeded by a clever ruse in decoying two pursuers bent on his destruction to the vicinity of a cloud, where several of his comrades were lying in wait for further victims. A moment later, both Germans were seen to fall earthward, spinning like leaves in that last terrible dive of death. These boys are Yankee aviators. They form the vanguard of America's aerial forces. We need thousands of others just like them, etc. Stories of this kind have, without doubt, a certain imaginative appeal. J.B. and I had often read them, never wholly credulous, of course, but with feelings of uneasiness, discounting them by more than half. We still had serious doubts of our ability to measure up to the standards set by our fellow Americans who had preceded us on active service. We were in part reassured during our first afternoon at the front. If these men were the demons on wings of the newspapers, they took great pains to give us a different impression. Many of the questions which had long been accumulating in our minds got themselves answered during the next few days. While we were waiting for machines, we knew, in a general way, what the nature of our work would be. We knew that the Escadelle Lafayette was one of four pursuit squadrons occupying hangars on the same field, and that, together, these formed what is called a group de combat, with a definite sector of front to cover. We had been told that combat pilots are the police of the air, whose duty it is to patrol the lines, harass the enemy, attacking whenever possible, thus giving protection to their own corps d'armée's aircraft, which are only incidentally fighting machines. In their work of reconnaissance, photography, artillery direction, and the like, but we did not know how this general theory of combat is given practical application. When I think of the depth of our ignorance to be filled in day by day with a little additional experience, of our self-confidence despite warnings, of our willingness to leave so much for our godfather chance to decide, it is with feelings nearly akin to awe we awaited our first patrol, almost ready to believe that it would be our first victorious combat. We had no realization of the conditions under which aerial battles are fought. Given goodwill, average ability, and the opportunity, we believed that the results must be decisive one way or the other. Much of our enforced leisure was spent at the bureau of the group, where the pilots gathered after each sortie, to make out the reports. There we heard accounts of exciting combats, of victories, and narrow escapes, which sounded like impossible fictions. A few of them may have been, but not many. They were told simply, briefly, as a part of the day's work, by men who no longer thought of their adventures as being either very remarkable or very interesting. What I thought will seem interesting or remarkable to them after the war, after such a life as this. Once an American gave me a hint. I'm going to apply for a job as attendant in a natural history museum. Only a few minutes before, these men had been taking part in aerial battles, attacking infantry in trenches, or enemy transport on roads fifteen or twenty kilometers away. And while they were talking of these things, the drone of motors overhead announced the departure of other patrols to battle lines, which were only five minutes distant by the route of the air. For when weather permitted, there was an interlapping series of patrols flying over the sector from daylight till dark. The number of these, and the number of avions in each patrol, varied as circumstances demanded. On one wall of the bureau hung a large-scale map of the sector, which we examined square by square, with that delight which only the study of maps can give. Trench systems, both French and German, were outlined upon it in minute detail. It contained other features of a very interesting nature. On another wall there was a yet larger map, made of aeroplane photographs taken at a uniform altitude so pieced together 
that the whole was a complete picture of our sector of front. We spent hours over this one, every trench, every shell hole, every splintered tree or fragment of farmhouse wall stood out clearly. We could identify machine gun posts and battery positions. We could see at a glance the result of months of fighting how terribly men had suffered under a rain of high explosive at this point, how lightly they had escaped at another, and so we could follow with a certain degree of accuracy what must have been the infantry actions at various parts of the line. The history of these trench campaigns will have a foreboding interest to the student of the future. For as he reads of the battles on the Essene, the Somme, of Verdun, and Flanders, he will have spread out before him photographs of the battlefields themselves, just as they were at different phases of the struggle. With a series of these pictorial records, men will be able to find the trenches from which their fathers or grandfathers scrambled with the regiments to the attack, the wire entanglements which held up the advance at one point, the shell holes where they lay under machine gun fire, and often they will see the men themselves as they advance through the barrage fire, the sun glinting on their helmets. It will be a fascinating study in a ghastly way. And while such records exist, the outward meanings, at least, of modern warfare will not be forgotten. Tiffin, the mess-room steward, was standing by my cot with a lighted candle in his hand. The furrows of his kindly old face were outlined in shadow. His bald head gleamed like the bottom of a yellow bowl, he said. Montance, monsieur. Put the candle on my table, and went out, closing the door softly. I looked at the window square, which was covered with oiled cloth for want of glass. It was a black patch, showing not a glimmer of light. The other pilots were gathering in the mess-room, where a fire was going. Someone started the phonograph. Fritz Chrysler was playing Chanson Saint Perrons. This was followed by a song. Oh, moving man, don't take my baby grand. It was a strange combination, and to hear them at that hour of the morning, before going out for a first sortie over the lines, gave me a mixed-up feeling, which it is impossible to analyze. Two patrols were to leave the field at the same time, one to cover a sector at an altitude of from 2,000 to 3,000 meters, the other 3,500 to 5,000 meters. J.B. and I were on high patrol, owing to our inexperience. It was to be a purely defensive one between our observation balloons and the lines. We had still many questions to ask, but having been so persistently inquisitive for three days running, we thought it best to wait for Talbot, who was leading our patrol, to volunteer his instructions. He went to the door to look at the weather. There were clouds at about 3,000 meters but the stars were shining through gaps in them. On the horizon, in the direction of the lines, broad belt of blue sky. The wind was blowing into Germany. He came back yawning. We'll go up, ho oh, hum, tremendous yawn, through a hole before we reach the river. It's going to be clear presently, so the higher we go, the better. The others yawned sympathetically. I don't feel very pugnastic this morning. It's a crime to send men out at this time of day, night, rather. More yawns of assent, of protest. J.B. and I were the only ones fully awake. We had finished our chocolate and were watching the clock uneasily, afraid that we would be late getting started. Ten minutes before patrol time we went out to the field. The canvas hangers billowed and flapped, and the wooden supports creaked with the quiet sound made by ships at sea and there was almost peace of the sea there, intensified, if anything, by the distant rumble of heavy cannonading. Our spad biplanes were drawn up in two long rows outside the hangars. They were in exact alignment, wing to wing. Some of them were clean and new, others discolored with smoke and oil. Among those latter were the ones which J.B. and I were to fly. Being new pilots, we were given used machines to begin with and ours had already seen much service. Fuselage and wings had many patches over the scars of old battles. But new motors had been installed, the bodies overhauled, 
and they were ready for further adventures. It mattered little to us that they were old. They were to carry us out to our first air battles. They were the first avions which we could call our own, and we loved them in an almost personal way. Each machine had an Indian head, the symbol of the Lafayette Corps, painted on the sides of the fuselage. In addition, it bore the personal mark of its pilot, a triangle, a diamond, a straight band, or an initial painted large so it could be easily seen and recognized in the air. The mechanicians were getting the motors en route, arming the machine guns, and giving a final polish to the glass of the windshields. In a moment every machine was turning over relente, with the purring sound of powerful engines, which gives a voice to one's feeling of excitement just before patrol time. There was no more yawning, no languid movement. Rodman was buttoning himself into a combination suit which appeared to add another six inches to his six feet two. Barry, who was leading the low patrol, wore a woolen helmet which left only his eyes uncovered. I had not before noticed how they blazed and snapped. All his energy seemed to be concentrated in them. Porter wore a leather face mask with a lozenge-shaped breathing hole and slanted openings covered with yellow glasses for eyes. He was the most fiendish-looking demon of them all. I was glad to turn from him to the duke, who wore a passe pantange of white silk, which fitted him like a bonnet. As he sat in his machine adjusting his goggles, he might have passed for a dear old lady preparing to read a chapter from the book of Daniel. The fur of Durman's helmet had frayed out, so that it fitted around the sides of his face and under the chin like a beard, the kind worn by old-fashioned sailors. The strain of waiting patiently for the start was trying. The sudden transformation of a group of typical-looking Americans into monsters and devotional old ladies gave a moment of diversion which helped to relieve it. I heard Talbot shouting his parting instructions and remembered that I did not know the rendezvous. I was already strapped in my machine and was about to loosen the fastenings when he came over and climbed on the step of the car. Rendezvous at two thousand, overfield, he yelled. I nodded. Know me, big T, wings, fuselage. I'll be turning right. You and the others left. When see me, start lines, fall behind, left. Remember, stick close, patrol. If get lost, better home, compass southwest. Look carefully, landmarks, going out. Got straight? I nodded again to show that I understood. Machines of both patrols were rolling across the field, mechanican running along beside each one. I joined the long line and taxied over to the starting point, where the captain was superintending the send-off, and turned into the wind in my turn. As though conscious of his critical eye, my old veteran's pad lifted its tail and gathered flying speed with all the vigor of its youth and we were soon high above the hangars, climbing to the rendezvous. When we had all assembled, Talbot headed northeast, the rest of us falling into our places behind him. Then I found, despite the new motor, my machine was not a rapid climber. Talbot noticed this and kept me well in the group, he and the others losing height in reversements and returnments, diving under me and climbing up again. It was fascinating to watch them doing stunts, to observe the constant changing of positions. Sometimes we seemed, all of us, to be hanging motionless, then rising and falling like small boats riding a heavy swell. Another glance would show one of them suspended bottom-up, falling sideways, tipped vertically on a wing, standing on its tail as though being blown about by the wind, out of all control. It is only in the air when moving with them, that one can really appreciate the variety and grace of movement of a flock of high-powered avions de chase. I was close to Talbot as we reached the cloud bank. I saw him in dim silhouette as the mist, sunlight filtered, closed around us, emerging into the clear, fine air above it. We might have been looking at early morning from the casement, opening on the foam of perilous seas in fiery lands forlorn. The sun was just rising, and the floor of cloud gathered with delicate shades of rose and amethyst and gold. I saw the others rising through it, at widely scattered points. 
It was a glorious sight. Then forming up and turning northward again, just as we passed over the receding edge of the cloud bank, I saw the lines. It was still dusk on the ground, and my first view was that of thousands of winking lights, the flashes of guns and the bursting of shells. At that time the Germans were making trials of the French positions along the Chemin des Dames, and the artillery fire was unusually heavy. The light soon faded, and the long winding battle front emerged from the shadow. A broad strip of desert land through a fair green country. We turned westward along the sector, several kilometers within the French lines, for J. B. and I were to have a general view of it all before we crossed to the other side. The fort of Malmaison was a minute square, not as large as a postage stamp. With thumb and forefinger, I could have spanned the distance between Sissons and Lyon. Clouds of smoke were arising from Alamont to Crayon, and these were constantly added to by infinitesimal puffs in black and white. I knew that shells of enormous caliber were wrecking trenches, bursting out huge craters, and yet not a sound, not the faintest reverberation of a gun. Here was a sight almost to make one laugh at man's idea of the importance of his pygmy wars. But the Olympian mood is a fleeting one. I think of Pardes, rising on one elbow out of the slime where he and his comrades were lying, waving his hand toward the wide, unspeakable landscape. What are we, chaps? And what's all this here? Nothing at all. All we can see is only a speck. When one speaks of the whole war, it's as if you said nothing at all. The words are strangled. We're here, and we look at it like blind men. To look down from a height of more than two miles, on an endless panorama of suffering and horror, is to have the sense of one's littleness even more painfully quickened. The best that the airman can do is to repeat, We're here, and we look at it like blind men. We passed on to the point where the line bends northward, then turned back. I tried to concentrate my attention on the work of identifying landmarks. It was useless. One might as well attempt to study Latin grammar at his first visit to the Grand Canyon. My thoughts went wool-gathering. Looking up suddenly, I found that I was alone. To the new pilot the sudden appearance or disappearance of other avions is a weird thing. He turns his head for a moment. When he looks again, his patrol has vanished. Combats are matters of a few seconds' duration, rarely of more than two or three minutes. The opportunity for attack comes almost with the swiftness of thought and has passed as quickly. Looking behind me, I was in time to see one machine tip and dive. Then it, too, vanished as though it had melted into the air. Shutting my motor, I started down swiftly. I thought, but I had not yet learned to fall vertically, and the others, I can say almost with truth, were miles below me. I passed long streamers of white smoke, crossing and recrossing in the air. I knew the meaning of these, machine gun, tracer bullets. The delicately penciled lines had not yet frayed out in the wind. I went on down in a steep spiral, guiding myself by them, and seeing nothing. At the point where I ended, I redressed and put on my motor. My altimeter registered two thousand meters. By a curious chance, while searching the empty sky, I saw a live shell passing through the air. It was just at the second when it reached the top of its trajectory and started to fall. Lord, I thought, I have seen a shell, and yet I can't find my patrol. While coming down, I had given no attention to my direction. I had lost twenty-five hundred meters in height. The trenches were now plainly visible, and the brown strip of sterile country where they lay was vastly broader. Several times I felt the concussion of shell explosions, my machine being lifted and then dropped gently with an uneasy motion. Constantly searching the air, I gave no thought to my position with reference to the lines, nor to the possibility of anti-aircraft fire. Talbot had said, never fly in a straight line for more than fifteen seconds. Keep changing your direction constantly, but be careful not to fly in a regular or irregular fashion. The German gunners may let you alone at first, hoping that you will become careless, or they may be plotting out your style of flight. 
Then they make their calculations and they let you have it. If you have been careless, they'll put them so close there'll be no question about the kind of a scare you will have. There wasn't, in my case. I was looking for my patrol, to the exclusion of thought of anything else. The first shell burst so close I lost control of my machine for a moment. Three others followed, two in front and one behind, which I believe have wrecked my tail. They burst with a terrific rending sound in clouds of coal black smoke. A few days before I had been watching without emotion the bombardment of a German plane. I had seen it twisting and turning through the escalements, and had heard the shells popping faintly, with a sound like the bursting of steed pods in the sun. My feeling was not that of fear exactly. It was more like despair. Every airman must have known it at one time or another. A sudden, overwhelming realization of the pitilessness of the forces which man let loose in war. In that moment one doesn't remember that men have loosed them. He is alone, and he sees the face of an utterly evil thing. Miller's advice was, think down to the gunners. But this is impossible at first. Once a French captain told me that he talked to the shells. I say, bonjour, mon voisins, comment cavoy? Ah, non, jes, jes, praise, or something like that. It amuses me. This need of some means of humanizing shell-fire is common. Aviators know little of modern warfare as it touches the infantrymen, but in one respect at least they are less fortunate. They miss the human companionship which helps a little to mask its ugliness. However, it is seldom that one is quite alone, without the sight of friendly planes near at hand, and there is a language of science which in a way fills this need. One may waggle his flappers, or flap his wings, to use the common expressions, and thus communicate with his comrades. Unfortunately, for my ease of mind, there were no comrades present with whom I could have conversed in this way. Miller was within five hundred meters and saw me all the time, although I didn't know this until later. Talbot's instructions were, if you get lost, go home. Somewhat ambiguous, I knew that my course to the aerodrome was southwest. At any rate, by flying in that direction I was certain to land in France, but with German gunners so keen on the baptism of fire business I had been turning in every direction, and the floating disk of my compass was revolving first to the right, then to the left. In order for, to let it settle I should have to fly straight for some fixed point for at least half a minute. Under the circumstances I was not willing to do this. A compass which would point north immediately, and always would be, a heaven-sent blessing to the inexperienced pilot during his first few weeks at the front. Mine was saying north, northwest, west, southwest, south, southeast, east, and after a moment of hesitation, reading off the points in the reverse order. The wind was blowing into Germany, and unconsciously, in trying to find a way out of the eclectiments, I was getting further and further away from home, and coming within range of additional batteries of hostile anti-aircraft guns. I might have landed at Karlstruth or Cologne, had it not been for Miller. My love for concentric circles of red, white, and blue dates from the moment when I saw the French Concord on his pad. And if I had been a hun, he said, when we landed at the aerodrome, oh, man, you were fruit salad, fruit salad, I tell you. I could have speared you with my eyes shut. I resented the implication of defenselessness. I said that I was keeping my eyes open, and if he had been a Hun, the fruit salad might not have been so palatable as it looked. Dominus, did you see me? I thought for a moment, and then said, yes. When? When you passed over my head and twenty seconds before that you would have been a sieve if either of us had been a Bosch. I yielded the point to save further argument. He had come swooping down fairly suddenly, when I saw him making his way so saucily among the escalements. I felt my confidence returning in increasing waves. I began to use my head, and found that it was possible to make the German gunners guess badly. There was no menace in shells barking at a distance and we were soon clear of all of them. J.B. took me aside the moment I landed. 
He had one of his fur boots in his hand and was wearing the other. He had also lighted the cork end of his cigarette. To one acquainted with his magisterial orderliness of mind and habit, these signs were eloquent. "'Now keep this quiet,' he said. "'I don't want the others to know it. But I've just had the adventure of my life. I attacked a German. Great Scott, what an opportunity, and I bungled it through being too eager.' When was this? Just after the other stove, you remember. I told him briefly of my experience, adding, and I didn't know there was a German in sight until I saw the smoke of the tracer bullets. Neither did I. Only I didn't see even the smoke. This cheered me immensely. What? You didn't? No, I saw nothing but sky where the others had disappeared. I was looking for them when I saw the German. He was about four hundred meters below me. He couldn't have seen me, I think, because he kept straight on. I dove, but didn't open fire until I could have a nearer view of his black crosses. I wanted to be sure. I had no idea that I was going so much faster. The first thing I knew, I was right on him. Had to pull back on my stick to keep from crashing into him. Up I went and fell into a nosedive. Then I came out of it. There was no sign of the German, and I hadn't fired a shot. Did you come home alone? No, I had the luck to meet the others just afterward. Now, not a word of this to anyone. But there was no need for secrecy. The near combat had been seen by both Talbot and Porter. At luncheon, we both came in for our share of ragging. You should have seen them following us down, said Porter, like two old rheumatics going to the subway. We saw them both when we were taking Hyde again. The scrap was over hours before and they were still a thousand meters away. You want to dive vertically. Needn't worry about your old bus. She'll stand it. Well, the Lord has certainly protected the innocent today. One of them was wandering off into Germany. Bill had to waggle Miller to page him. And there was Drew, going down on that biplane we were chasing. I've been trying to think of one wrong thing he might have done, which he didn't do. First he dove with the sun in his face, when he might have had it at his back. Then he came all the way in full view instead of getting under his tail. Good thing the militour was firing at us. After that, when he had the chance of a lifetime, he fell into a virel and scared the life out of the rest of us. I thought the gunner had turned on him. And while we were following him down to see where he was going to splash, the Bosch got in the way. All this happened months ago. But every trifling incident connected with our first patrol is still in mind. And twenty years from now, if I have a chance to hear Chasons dans paroles, or if I hum to myself a few bars of a ballad, then sure to be long forgotten by the world at large. Oh, moving man, don't take my baby grand. I shall have only to close my eyes and wait passively. First Tiffin will come with the lighted candle. Beau temps, monsieur. I shall hear Talbot shouting, Rendezvous two thousand over field. If get lost, better home. J.B. will rush up, smoking the cork end of his cigarette. I've just had the adventure of my life, and Miller, sitting on an essence case, will have lost none of his old conviction. Oh, man, you were fruit salad. Fruit salad, I tell you. I could have speared you with my eyes shut. And in those days, happily still far off, there will be many another old gray beard with such memories, unless they are all to wear out their days uselessly regretting that they are no longer young. There must be clubs where they may exchange reminiscences. These need not be pretentious affairs. Let there be a strong odor of burnt castor oil and gasoline as you enter the door, a wide view from the verandas of earth and sky, maps on the walls, and on the roof, a canvas pantaloon leg, to catch the wind. Nothing else matters very much. There they will be as happy as any old airman can expect to be, arguing about the winds and disputing one another's judgment about the height of the clouds. If you say to one of them, tell us something about the great war, as likely as not he will tell you a pleasant story enough. And the pity of it will be that, hearing the tale, a young man will long for another war. Then you must say to him, But what about the shell-fire? 
tell us something of machines falling in flames. Then, if he is an honest old airman whose memory is still unimpaired, the young one who has been listening will have sober second thoughts. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of High Adventure, a Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. High Adventure, a Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. Chapter Six, A Balloon Attack. I'm looking for two balloonatics, said Talbot, as he came into the mess room, and I think I've found them. Percy, Talbot's orderly, Tiffin the steward, Drew, and I were the only occupants of the room. Percy is an old legionnaire, crippled with rheumatism. His active service days are over. Tiffin's working hours are filled with numberless duties. He makes the beds and serves food from three to five times daily to members of the Esquadelle Lafayette. These two being eliminated, the identity of the balloonatics was plain. The orders have just come, Talbot added, and I decided that the first men I met after leaving the Bureau would be the balloonatics. Virtue has gone into both of you. Now, if you can make fire come out of a Bosch sausage, you will have done all that is required. Listen, this is interesting. The orders are in French, but I will translate as I read. On the umpteenth day of June, the escalades of Groupe de Combat Blanc, that's ours, will cooperate in an attack on the German observation balloons along the sector extending from X to Y. The patrols to be furnished are 1. Two patrols of protection of five avions each by the escalades Spa 87 and Spa 12. 2. Four patrols of attack of three avions each by the escadales Spa 124, that's us, Spa 93, Spa 10, and Spa 12. The attack will be organized as follows. On the day set, weather permitting, the two patrols of protection will leave the field at 10.30 a.m. The patrol of Spa 87 will rendezvous over the village of N. The patrol of protection of Spa 12 will rendezvous over the village of C at 10.45, precisely. They will start for the lines crossing at an altitude of 3,500 meters. The patrol furnished by Spa 87 will guard the sector from X to T, between the town of O and the two enemy balloons on that sector. The patrol furnished by Spa 12 will guard the sector from T to Y, between the railway line and the two enemy balloons on that sector. Immediately after the attack has been made, these formations will return to the aerodrome. At 10.40 a.m. the four patrols of attack will leave the field and will rendezvous as follows. Here followed the directions. At 10.55, precisely, they will start for the lines crossing at an approximate altitude of 1,600 meters, each patrol making in a direct line for the balloon assigned to it. Numbers 1 and 2 of each of these patrols will carry rockets. Number 3 will fly immediately above them offering further protection in case of attack by enemy aircraft. Number one of each patrol will first attack the balloon. If he fails, number two will attack. If number one is successful, number two will then attack the observers in their parachutes. If number one fails and number two is successful, number three will attack the observers. The patrol will then proceed to the aerodrome by the shortest route. Squadron commanders will make a return before noon today of the names of pilots designated by them for their respective patrols. In case of unfavorable weather, squadron commanders will be informed of the date to which the attack has been postponed. Pilots designated as numbers one and two of the patrols of attack will be relieved from the usual patrol duty from this date. They will employ their time at rocket shooting. A target will be in place on the east side of the field from 1.30 p.m. today. Are there any remarks, said Talbot? as if he had been reading the minutes at a debating club meeting. Yes, said J.B., when is the umpteenth of June? Ah, mon vieux. That's the question. The
the commandant knows and he isn't telling any other little thing i suggested that we would like to know which of us was to be number one that's right drew how would you like to be the first rocketeer i have no objections said j b grinning as if the frenzy of balloon attacking had already gone into his blood right that's settled i'll see your mechanicans about fitting your machines for rockets you can begin practice this afternoon percy had been listening with interest to the conversation you got some nice job you boys but if you bring him down there will be a lot of chuckling in the trenches you won't hear it but they will all be saying bravo ifant i've been there i've seen it and i know does em all good to see a sausage brought down there's another one of their eyes knocked out i'd say percy is right said j b as we were walking down the road destroying a balloon is not a great achievement in itself of course it's so much equipment gone so much expense added to the german war budget that is something but the effect on the infantrymen is the important thing wash soldiers thousands of them will see one of their balloons coming down in flame they will be saying where are our airmen like those old polis we met at the station when we first came out it's bound to influence morale now let's see the balloon we will say is at sixteen hundred meters at that height it can be seen by men on the ground within a radius of and so forth and so on we figured it out approximately estimating the numbers of soldiers of all branches of service who would witness the sight multiplying this number by four our conclusion was that as a result of the expedition the length of the war and its outcome might very possibly be affected at any rate there would be such an ebbing of german morale and such a flooding of french that the way would be opened to a decisive victory on the front but supposing we should miss our sausage j b grew thoughtful have another look at the orders i don't remember what the instructions were in case we both fail i read if number one fails and number two is successful number three will attack the observers the patrol will then proceed to the aerodrome by the shortest route this was plain enough allowance could be made for one failure but two the possibility had not even been considered by the shortest route there was a piece of sly humor for you it may have been unconscious but we preferred to believe that the commandant had chuckled as he dictated it a sort of afterthought as much as to say to his pilots well you young bucks you would be airmen thought it would be all sport eh you might have known it's your own fault now go out and attack those balloons it's possible that you may have a scrap or two on your hands while you're at it oh yes by the way coming home you'll be down pretty low every bosch machine in the air will have you at a disadvantage better return by the shortest route one feature of the program did not appeal to us greatly and this was the attack to be made on the observers when they had jumped with their parachutes it seemed as near the border-line between legitimate warfare and cold-blooded murder as anything could well be you are armed with a machine-gun he may have an automatic pistol it will require from five to ten minutes for him to reach the ground after he has jumped you can come down on him like a stone well it's your job thank the lord not mine said drew it was my job but i insisted that he would be an accomplice in destroying the balloon he would force me to attack the observers when i asked talbot if this feature of the attack could be eliminated he said certainly i have instructions from the commandant touching on this point in case any pilot objects to attacking the observers with machine-gun fires he is to strew their parachutes with autumn leaves and such field flowers as the season affords now listen what difference ethically is there between attacking one observation officer in a parachute and dropping a ton of bombs on a trainload of soldiers and to kill the observer is really more important than to destroy the balloon if you are going to be a military pilot for the love of pete and alf be one he was right of course but that didn't make the prospect any more pleasant the large map at the bureau now had greater interest for us than ever 
The German balloons along the sector were marked in pictorially, with an ink line representing the cable running from the basket of each one down to the exact spot on the map from which they were launched. Under one of these, Spa 124 was printed, neatly in red ink. It was the farthest distant from our lines of the four to be attacked, and about ten kilometers within German-held territory. The cable ran to the outskirts of a village situated on a railroad and a small stream. The location of enemy aviation fields was also shown pictorially, each one represented by a minute sketch, very carefully made of an albatross biplane. We noticed that there were several aerodromes not far distant from our balloon. After a survey of the map, the commandant's afterthought, by the shortest route, was not so needless as it appeared at first. The German positions were in a salient, a large corner, the line turning almost at right angles. We could cross them from the south, attack our balloon, and then, if we wished, return to French territory on the west side of the salient. We may miss some heavy shelling. If we double on our tracks going home, they will be expecting us, of course, whereas if we go out on the west side, we will pass over batteries which didn't see us come in. If there should happen to be an east wind, there will be another reason in favor of the plan. The commandant is a shrewd soldier. It may have been his way of saying that the longest way round is the shortest way home. Our spads were ready after luncheon. A large square of tin had been fashioned over the fabric of each lower wing, under the rocket fittings, to prevent danger of fire from sparks. Racks for six rockets, three on a side, had been fastened to the struts. The rockets were tipped with sharp steel points to ensure their pricking the silk balloon envelope. The batteries for igniting them were connected with a button inside the car, within an easy reach of the pilot. Lieutenant Verdane, our French second-in-command, was to supervise our practice on the field. We were glad of this. If we failed to spear our sausage, it would not be through lack of efficient instruction. He explained to Drew how the thing was to be done. He was to come on the balloon into the wind, and preferably not more than four hundred meters above it. He was to let it pass from view under the wing. Then, when he judged that he was directly over it, to reduce his motor and dive vertically, placing the bag within the line of his two circular sights, holding it there until the bag just filled the circle. At that second, he would be about 250 meters distant from it, and it was then that the rockets should be fired. The instructions were simple enough. But in practicing on the target, we found that they were not so easy to carry out. It was hard to judge accurately the moment for diving. Sometimes we overshot the target, but more often we were short of it. Owing to the angle at which the rockets were mounted on the struts, it was very important that the dive should be vertical. One morning the attack could have been made with every chance of success. Drew and I left the aerodrome a few minutes before sunrise for a trial flight, that we might give our motors a thorough testing. We climbed through a heavy mist which lay along the ground like water, filling every fold and hollow, following up the hillsides, submerging everything but the crests of the highest hills. The tops of the twin spires of S. Cathedral were all that could be seen of the town. Beyond the long chain of heights where the first-line trenches were, rose just clear of the mist, which glowed blood-red as the sun came up. The balloons were already up, hanging above the dense cloud of vapor, elongated planets drifting in space. The observers were directing the fire of the batteries to those positions which stood revealed. Shells were also exploding on lower ground, for we saw the mist billow upward time after time with the force of mighty concussions, and slowly settle again. It was an awe-inspiring sight. We might have been watching the last battle of the last war that could ever be, with the world still fighting on, bitterly, blindly, gradually sinking from sight in a sea of blood. I have never seen anything to equal that spectacle of an artillery battle in the mists. Conditions were ideal for the attack. We could have gone to the objective, fired our rockets, and made a return without once having been seen from the ground. It was an opportunity made in heaven, an allied heaven. But the infantry would not have seen it, said J.B., which was true. 
not that we cared to do the thing in a spectacular fashion we were thinking of the decisive effect upon morale two hours later we were pitching pennies in one of the hangars when talbot came across the field followed solemnly by whiskey and soda the lion mascots of the escadale lafayette what's the date anybody know he asked very casually j b is an agile-minded youth it isn't the upteenth by any chance right the first time he looked at his watch it is now ten past ten you have half an hour better get your rockets attached how are your motors all right this was one way of breaking the news and the best one i think if we had been told the night before we should have slept badly the two patrols of protection left the field exactly on schedule time at ten thirty five irving drew and i were strapped in our machines waiting for our motors turning Relente for Talbot's signal to start. He was romping with whiskey. Atta boy, whiskey! Eat him up! Eat him up! At old lion! As a squadron leader, Talbot has many virtues, but the most important of them all is his casualness, and he is so sincere and natural in it. He has no conception of the dramatic possibilities of a situation, something to be profoundly thankful for in the commander of an escadale de chase situations are dramatic enough tense enough without one's taking thought of the fact he might have stood there watch in hand counting off the seconds he might have said remember we're all counting on you don't let us down you've got to get that balloon instead of that he glanced at his watch as if he had just remembered us all right run along you sausage spears we're having lunch at twelve that will give you time to wash up after you get back Miller, of course, had to have a parting shot. He had been hiding somewhere until the last moment. Then he came rushing up with a toothbrush and a safety razor case. He stood, waving them as I taxied around into the wind. His purpose was to remind me of the possibility of landing with a panne de moteur in Germany, and the need I would have of my toilet articles. At 10.54, J.B. came slanting down over me, then pulled up in a Légion de Vol and went straight for the lines. I fell in behind him at about one hundred meters distance. Irving was two hundred meters higher. Before we left the field, he said, You are not to think about Germans. That's my job. I'll warn you if I see that we are going to be attacked. Go straight for the balloon. If you don't see me come down and signal, you will know that there is no danger. The French artillery were giving splendid cooperation. I saw clusters of shell explosions on the ground. The gunners were carrying out their part of the program, which was to register on enemy anti-aircraft batteries as we passed over them. They must have made good practice. Anti-aircraft fire was feeble, and such of it as there was, very wild. We came within view of the railway line, which runs from the German lines to a large town, their most important distributing center on the sector. Following it along with my eyes to the halfway point, I saw the red roofs of the village which we had so often looked at from a distance. Our balloon was in its usual place. It looked like a yellow plum, and no larger than one, but ripe, ready to be plucked. A burst of flame far to the left attracted my attention, and almost at the same moment one to the right. Ribbons of fire flapped upwards in clouds of black oily smoke. Drew signaled with his joystick, and I knew what he meant. Hooray! Two down, and it's our turn next. But we were still three or four minutes away. That was unfortunate, for a balloon can be drawn down with amazing speed. A rocket sailed into the air and burst in a point of greenish-white light, dazzling in its brilliancy, even in the full light of day. Immediately after this, two white objects, so small as to be hardly visible, floated earthward. The parachutes of the observers. They had jumped. The balloon disappeared from view behind Drew's machine. It was being drawn down, of course, as fast as the motor could wind up the cable. It was an exciting moment for us. We were coming on at two hundred kilometers an hour, racing against time, and very little time of that. Sheridan, only five miles away, could not have been more eager for his journey to end. Our throttles were wide open, the engines developing their highest capacity for power. I swerved out to one side for another glimpse of the target. It was almost on the ground and directly under us. Drew made a steep virage and dive. I started after him in a tight spiral to look for the observers, but they had both disappeared. 
The balloon was swaying from side to side under the tension of the cable. It was hard to keep it in view. I lost it under my wing. Tipping up on the other side, I saw Drew release his rockets. They spurted out in long, wavering lines of smoke. He missed. The balloon lay close to the ground, looking larger, riper than ever. The sight of its smooth, sleek surface was the most tantalizing of invitations. Letting it pass under me again, I waited for a second or two, then shut down the motor, and pushed forward on the control stick until I was falling vertically. Standing upright on the rudder bar, I felt the tugging of the shoulder straps. Getting the bag well within the sights, I held it there until it just filled the circle. Then I pushed the button. Although it was only eight o'clock, both Drew and I were in bed, for we were both very tired. It was a chilly evening, and we had no fire. An oil lamp was on a table between the two cots. Drew was sitting propped up, his fur coat rolled into a bundle for a backrest. He had a sweater, tied by the sleeves around his shoulders. His hands were clasped around his blanketed knees, and his breath rising in a cloud of luminous steam. Like pious incense from a censer old, seemed taking flight for heaven without a death. And yet pious is hardly the word. J. B. was swearing, drawn from a coarse reserve of picturesque epithet, which I did not know that he possessed. I regret the necessity of admitting some of them. I don't see how I could have missed it. Why? I didn't turn to look at least thirty seconds. I was that sure that I had brought it down. Then I banked and nearly fell out of my seat when I saw it there. I redressed at four hundred meters. I couldn't have been more than one hundred meters away when I fired the rockets. What did you do then? Circle around waiting for you. I had the balloon inside all the while you were diving. It was a great sight to watch from below, particularly when you let go your rockets. I'll never forget it. Never. But, Lord, without the climax, artistically, it was an awful fizzle. There was no denying this. A balloon bonfire was the only possible conclusion to the adventure, and we both failed at lighting it. I, too, redressed when very close to the bag, and made a steep bank in order to escape the burst of flame from the ignited gas. The rockets leapt out with a fine, blood-stirring roar. The mere sound ought to have been enough to make any balloon collapse. But when I turned, there it was, intact, a super Brabogian pumpkin, seen at close view and still ripe still ready for plucking. If I live to be one hundred years, I shall never have a greater surprise or a more bitter disappointment. There was no leisure for brooding over it then. My altimeter registered only two hundred and fifty meters, and the French lines were far distant. If the motor failed, I should have to land in German territory. Any fate but that. Nevertheless, I felt in the pocket of my combination to be sure that my box of matches was safely in place. We were cautioned always to carry them where they could be quickly got, in case of a forced landing in enemy country. An airman must destroy his machine in such an event, but my spad did not mean to end its career so ingloriously. The motor ran beautifully, hitting on every cylinder. We climbed from 250 meters to 350, 450, and on steadily upward. In the vicinity of the balloon, machine gun fire from the ground had been fairly heavy but I was soon out of range, and saw the tracer bullets like swarms of blue bubbles, curving downward again at the end of their trajectory. No machines, either French or German, were in sight. Irving had disappeared some time before we reached the balloon. I had not seen Drew from the moment when he fired his rockets. He waited until he made sure that I was following, then started for the west side of the salient. I did not see him because of my interest in those clouds of blue bubbles which were rising with anything but bubble-like tranquillity. When I was clear of them, I sent my course westward and parallel with the enemy lines to the south. I had never flown so low so far in German territory. The temptation to forget precaution and make a leisurely survey of the ground beneath was hard to resist. It was not wholly resisted, in fact. Anti-aircraft fire was again feeble and badly ranged. The shells burst far behind and above, for I was much too low to offer an easy target. This gave me a dangerous sense of safety, and so I tipped up on one side and then on the other, examining the roads, searching the ruins of villages, the trenches, the shell-marked ground. I saw no living thing, brute or human. 
nothing but endless, inconceivable desolation. The foolishness of that close scrutiny alone, without the protection of other avions, I realize now much better than I did then. Unless flying at six thousand meters or above, when he is comparatively safe from attack, a pilot may never relax his vigilance for thirty seconds together. He must look behind him, below, above, constantly. All aviators learn this eventually, but in the case of many new pilots the knowledge comes too late to be of service. I thought this was to be my experience when, looking up, I saw five combat machines bearing down upon me. Had they been enemy planes, my chances would have been very small, for they were close at hand before I saw them. The old French aviator, worn out by his five hundred hours of flight over the trenches, said, Save your nervous energy. I exhausted a three months' reserve in as many seconds. The suspense, luckily, was hardly longer than that. It passed when the patrol leader, followed by the others, pulled up in a lingerie de vol, about one hundred meters above me, showing their French concords. It was a group of protection of Spa 87. At the time I saw Drew, a quarter of a mile away. As he turned, the sunlight glinted along his rocket tubes. A crowded hour of glorious life, it seems now, although I was not of this opinion at the time. In reality, we were absent barely forty minutes. Climbing out of my machine at the aerodrome, I looked at my watch. A quarter to twelve. Langier, the sergeant mechanician, was sitting in a sunny corner of the hangar, reading the Martin, just as I had left him. Lieutenant Talbot's only comment was, don't let her worry you. Better luck next time. The group bagged two out of four, and Irving knocked down a Bosch who was trying to get at you. That isn't bad for half an hour's work. But the decisive effect on morale, which was to result from our wholesale destruction of balloons, was diminished by half. We had four stars down, but it bobbed up again very soon afterward. The one o'clock patrol saw it higher. Miller said then that it had ever been. It was Miller, by the way, who looked on us at nine o'clock the same evening. The lamp was out. Asleep? Neither of us was, but we didn't answer. He closed the door, then reopened it. It's laziness. That's what it is. They ought to put you on school regime again. He had one more afterthought. Looking in a third time, he said, How about it, you little old human dynamos? Are you getting rusty? End of chapter six. of High Adventure, a narrative of air fighting in France, by James Norman Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. High Adventure, a narrative of air fighting in France, by James Norman Hall, Chapter 7. Brought Down. The preceding chapters of this journal have been written to little purpose if it has not been made clear that Drew and I, like most pilots during the first weeks of service at the front, were worth little to the Allied cause. We were warned often enough that the road to efficiency in military aviation is a long and dangerous one. We were given much excellent advice by aviators who knew what they were talking about. Much of this we solicited, in fact, and then proceeded to disregard it, item by item, Eager to get results, we plunged into our work, with the valor of ignorance, the result being that Drew was shot down in one of his first encounters, escaping with his life by one of those more than miracles for which there is no explanation. That I did not fare as badly or worse is due solely to the indulgence of that godfather of ours, already mentioned, who watched over my first flights while in a mood beneficently pro-ally. Drew's adventure followed soon after our first patrol when he had the near combat with the two-seater. Luckily, on that occasion, both the German pilot and his machine-gunner were taken completely off their guard. Not only did he attack with the sun squarely in his face, but he went down in a long, gradual dive, in full view of the gunner who could not have asked for a better target. But the man was asleep, and this gave J.B. a dangerous contempt for all gunners of enemy nationality. Lieutenant Talbot cautioned him, you have been lucky, but don't get it into your head that this sort of thing happens often. Now, I'm going to give you a standing order. You are not to attack again, neither of you, are to think of attacking during your first month here, 
As likely as not, it would be your luck next time to meet an old pilot. If you did, I wouldn't give much for your chances. He would outmaneuver you in a minute. You will go out on patrol with the others, of course. It's the only way to learn to fight. But if you get lost, go back to our balloons and stay there, until it is time to go home. Neither of us obeyed this order, and, as it happened, Drew was the one to suffer. A group of American officers visited the squadron one afternoon, in courtesy to our guest. It was decided to send out all the pilots for an additional patrol to show them how the thing was done. Twelve machines were in readiness for the sortie, which was set for seven o'clock, the last one of the day. We were to meet at three thousand meters, and then to divide forces, one patrol to cover the east half of the sector, and one the west. We got away beautifully, with the exception of Drew, who had motor trouble, and who was five minutes late in starting. With his permission, I insert here his own account of the adventure, a letter written while he was in hospital. No doubt you are wondering what happened, listening meanwhile to many I-told-you-so explanations from the others. This will be hard on you, but bear up, son. It might not be a bad plan to listen, with the understanding as well as to the ear, to some expert advice on how to bag the Hun. To quote the prophetic Miller, I am telling you this for your own good. I gave my name and the number of the Escradel to the medical officer at the Poste de Secours. He said he would phone the captain at once, so that you must know before this that I have been amazingly lucky. I fell the greater part of two miles, count em, two, before I actually regained control, only to lose it again. I fainted while still several hundred feet from the ground, but more of this later. Couldn't sleep last night, had a fever, and my brain went on a spree. Taking advantage of my helplessness, I just lay in bed and watched it function. Besides, there was a great artillery racket all night long. It appeared to be coming from our sector, so you must have heard it as well. This hospital is not very far back, and we get the full orchestral effect of heavy firing. The result is that I am dead tired today. I believe I can sleep for a week. They have given me a bed in the officer's ward, me, a corporal. It is because I am an American, of course. Wish there was some way of showing one's appreciation for so much kindness. My neighbor on the left is a Cheshire captain. A hand grenade exploded in his face. He will go through life horribly disfigured. An old padre with two machine-gun bullets in his hip is on the other side. He's very patient, but sometimes the pain is a little bit too much for him. To a Frenchman, ooh la la is an expression for every conceivable kind of emotion. In the future, it will mean unbearable physical pain to me. Our orderlies are two polois, long past military age. They are as gentle and thoughtful as the nurses themselves. One of them brought me lemonade all night long, worthwhile getting wounded, just to have something to taste so good. I meant to finish this letter a week ago, but haven't felt up to it. Quite perky this morning. So I'll go on with the tale of my heroic combat. Only first, tell me how that absurd account of it got into the Herald. I hope Talbot knows that I was not foolish enough to attack six Germans single-handed. If he doesn't, please enlighten him. His opinion of my common sense must be low enough as it is. We were to meet over S at 3,000 meters, you remember, and to cover the sector at 5,000 until dusk. I was late in getting away, and by the time I reached the rendezvous, you had all gone. There wasn't a chase machine in sight. I ought to have gone back to the balloons, as Talbot advised, but thought it would be easy to pick you up later. So went on alone after I had got some height, crossed the lines at 3,500 meters, and finally got up to 4,000, which was the best I could do with my rebuilt engine. The Huns started shelling but there were only a few of them that barked. I went down the lines for a quarter of an hour, meeting two Sopworths and a leotard, but no spots. You were almost certain to be higher than I, but my old packet was doing its best at four thousand, and getting overheated with the exertion. Had to throttle down in the peak several times to cool off. Then I saw you, at least I thought it was you, about four kilometers inside the German lines. I counted six machines while grouped, one a good deal higher than the others, and one several hundred meters below them. The pilot on top was doing beautiful reversements, and an occasional barrel turn in Barry's manner. 
I was so certain it was our patrol that I started over at once to join you. It was getting dusk, and I lost sight of the machine lowest down for a few seconds. Without my knowing it, he was approaching at exactly my altitude. You know how difficult it is to see a machine in that position. Suddenly he loomed up in front of me like an express train, as you have seen them approach from the depths of a moving picture screen, only ten times faster, and he was firing as he came. I realized my awful mistake, of course. His tracer bullets were going by on the left side, but he corrected his aim, and my motor seemed to be eating them up. I banked to the right, and was about to cut my motor and dive when I felt a smashing blow in the left shoulder, a sickening sensation, and a very peculiar one, not at all what I thought it might feel like to be hit with a bullet. I believed that it came from the German in front of me, but it couldn't have for he was still approaching when I was hit, and I have learned that the bullet entered from behind. This is the history of less than a minute I'm giving you. It seemed much longer than that, but I don't suppose it was. I tried to shut down the motor, but couldn't manage it, because my left arm was gone. I really believed that it had been blown off into space until I glanced down and saw that it was still there, but for any service it was to me, I might just as well have lost it. There was a vacant period of ten to fifteen seconds, which I can't fill in. After that, I knew that I was falling, with my motor going full speed. It was a helpless realization. My brain refused to act. I could do nothing. Finally, I did have one clear thought. Am I on fire? This cut right through the fog, brought me up broad awake. I was falling almost vertically, in a sort of half barrel. No machine but a spad could have stood the strain. The Huns were following me and were not far away, judging by the sound of their guns. I fully expected to feel another bullet or two boring its way through. One did cut the skin of my right leg, although I didn't know this until I reached the hospital. Perhaps it was well that I did fall out of control, for the firing soon stopped, the Germans thinking, and with reason, that they had bagged me. Some proud Bosch airman is wearing an iron cross on my account. Perhaps the whole crew of daredevils has been decorated. However, no unseemly sarcasm. We would pounce on a lonely Hun just as quickly. There is no chivalry in war these modern days. I pulled out of the spin, got the broomstick between my knees, reached over and shut down the motor with my right hand. The propeller stopped dead. I didn't much care, being very drowsy and tired. The worst of it was that I couldn't get my breath. I was gasping as though I had been hit in the pit of the stomach. Then I lost control again, started falling. It was awful. I was almost ready to give up. I believe that I said out loud, I'm going to be killed. This is my last sortie. At any rate, I thought it. Made one last effort and came out in Le Jeune du Vol, as nearly as I could judge about 150 meters from the ground. It was an ugly-looking place for landing, trenches and shell holes everywhere. I was wondering in a vague way whether they were French or German, when I fell into the most restful sleep I've ever had in my life. I have no recollection of the crash, not the slightest. I might have fallen as gently as a leaf. That is one thing to be thankful for among a good many others. When I came to, it was at once, completely. I knew that I was on a stretcher and remembered immediately exactly what had happened. My heart was going pit-a-pat, pit-a-pat, and I could hardly breathe but I had no sensation of pain except in my chest. This made me think that I had broken every bone in my body. I tried moving first one leg, then the other, then my arms, my head, my body. No trouble at all, except with my left arm and side. I accepted the miracle without attempting to explain it, for I had something more important to wonder about. Who had the handles of my stretcher? The first thing I did was to open my eyes but I was bleeding from a scratch on the forehead and saw only a red blur. I wiped them dry with my sleeve and looked again. The broad back in front of me was covered with mud, impossible to distinguish the color of the tunic. But the shrapnel helmet above it was French. I was in French hands. If ever I live long enough in one place so that I may gather a few possessions and make a home for myself on one wall of my living room, I will have a bust-length portrait, review, of a French branchadier, 
mud-covered back and battered tin hat. Do you remember our walk with Merlot in the rain and the Dijour at the restaurant where they made such wonderful omelettes? I'm sure that you will recall the occasion, although you may have forgotten the conversation. I have not forgotten one remark of Meinault's apropos of talk about risks. If a man were willing, he said, to stake everything for it, he would accumulate an experience of fifteen or twenty minutes, which would compensate him, a thousand times over, for all the hazard. And if you live to be old, he said quaintly, you can never be bored with life. You will have something always very pleasant to think about. I mention this in connection with my discovery that I was not in German hands. I have had five minutes of perfect happiness without any background, no thought of yesterday or tomorrow to spoil it. I said, Bonjour, monsieurs, in a gurgling voice. The man in front turned his head sideways and said, Tiens, cava, monsieur, la aviator? The other one said, Ah, mon vo. You know the infection they give this expression, particularly when it means, this is something wonderful. He added that they had seen the combat and my fall, and little expected to find the pilot living, to say nothing of speaking. I hoped that they would go on talking, but I was being carried along a trench. They had to lift me shoulder high at every turn, and needed all their energy. The Germans were shelling the lines, several fell fairly close and they brought me down a long flight of wooden steps into a dugout to wait until the worst of it should be over. While waiting, they told me that I had fallen just within the first line trenches at a spot where a slight rise in ground hid me from the sight of the enemy. Otherwise, they might have had a bad time rescuing me. My spad was completely wrecked. It fell squarely into a trench, the wings breaking the force of the fall. Before reaching the ground, I turned they said, and was making straight for Germany, fifty meters higher, and I would have come down in no man's land. For a long time we listened in silence to the subdued grump, grump of the shells. Sometimes showers of earth pattered down the stairway, and we would hear the high-pitched droning zzzz of pieces of shell casing as they whizzed over the opening. One of them would say, Not far that one, or... He's looking for someone, that fellow, in a voice without a hint of emotion. Then long silences and other deep, earth-shaking rumbles. They asked me several times if I was suffering, and offered to go to the poste socors if I wanted them to. It was not heavy bombardment, but it would be safer to wait for a little while. I told them that I was ready to go on at any time, but not to hurry on my account. I was quite comfortable. The light glimmering down the stairway faded out, and we were in complete darkness. My brain was amazingly clear. It registered every trifling impression. I wish it might always be so intensely awake and active. There seemed to be four of us in the dugout, the two brancardiers, and the second self of mine, as curious as an eavesdropper at a keyhole, listening intently to everything, and then turning to whisper to me. The branch of the deers repeated the same comments after every explosion. I thought, they have been saying this to each other for over three years. It has become automatic. They will never be able to stop. I was feverish, perhaps. If it was fever, it burned away any illusions I may have had of modern warfare from the infantryman's viewpoint. I know that there is no glamour in it for them, that it has long since become a deadly monotony, an endless repetition of the same kinds of horror and suffering, a boredom more terrible than death itself, which is repeating itself in the same ways day after day and month after month. It isn't often that an aviator has the chance I've had. It would be a good thing if they were to send us into the trenches for twenty-four hours every few months. It would make us keener fighters, more eager to do our utmost to bring the war to an end for the sake of the polos. The dressing station was in a very deep dugout, lighted by candles. At a table in the center of the room, the medical officer was working over a man with a terribly crushed leg. Several others were sitting or lying along the wall, awaiting their turn. They watched every movement he made in an apprehensive, animal way, and so did I. 
They put me on the table next, although it was not my turn. I protested, but the doctor paid no attention. Aviator American again? It's a pity that Frenchmen can't treat us Americans as though we belong here. As soon as the doctor had finished with me, my stretcher was fastened to a two-wheeled carrier, and we started down a cobbled road to the ambulance station. I was light-headed and don't remember much of that part of the journey. Had to take refuge in another dugout when the Huns dropped a shell on an ammunition dump in the village through which we were to pass. There was a deafening banging and booming for a long time, and when we did go through the town, it was on the run. The whole place was in flames and small arms ammunition still exploding. I remember seeing a long column of soldiers going at the double in the opposite direction, and they were in full marching order. Well, this is the end of the tale, all of it at any rate, in which you would be interested. It was one o'clock in the morning before I got between cool, clean sheets, and I was wounded about a quarter past eight. I have been tired ever since. There is another aviator here, a Frenchman, who broke his jaw and both legs in a fall while returning from a night bombardment. His bed is across the aisle from mine. He has a formidable-looking apparatus fastened on his head and under his chin, to hold his jaw firm until the bones knit. He is forbidden to talk, but breaks the rule whenever the nurse leaves the ward. He speaks a little English, and has told me a delightful story about the origin of aerial combat. A French pilot, a friend of his, he says, attached to a certain army group during August and September 1914, often met a German aviator during his reconnaissance patrols. In those Arcadian days, fighting in the air was a development for the future, and these two pilots exchanged greetings not cordially perhaps but courteously a wave of the hand as much as to say we are enemies but we need not forget civilities then they both went about their work of spotting batteries watching for movements of troops etc one morning the german failed to return the salute the frenchman thought little of this and greeted him in the customary manner at their next meeting to his surprise the boss shook his fist at him in the most blustering and cattish way there was no mistaking the insult they had passed not fifty meters from each other, and the Frenchman distinctly saw the closed fist. He was saddened by the incident, for he had hoped that some of the ancient courtesies of war would survive in the aerial branch of the service at least. It angered him, too. Therefore, on his next reconnaissance, he ignored the German. Evidently, the Bosch air squadrons were being Prussianized. The enemy pilot approached very closely and threw a missile at him. He could not be sure what it was, as the object went wide of the mark. But he was so incensed that he made a virage, and, drawing a small flask from his pocket, hurled it at his boorish antagonist. The flask contained some excellent port, he said, but he was repaid for the loss in seeing it crash on the exhaust pipe of the enemy machine. This marked the end of courtesy and the beginning of active hostilities in the air. They were soon shooting at each other with rifles, automatic pistols, and at last with machine guns. Later developments we know about. The night bombardier has been telling me this yarn in serial form. When the nurse is present, he illustrates the last chapter by means of gestures. I am ready to believe everything but the incident about the port. That doesn't sound plausible. A Frenchman would have thrown his watch before making such a sacrifice. End of chapter 7《Adventure》A Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, MikeVendetti.com. High Adventure A Narrative of Air Fighting in France by James Norman Hall. Chapter 8 One Hundred Hours. A little more than a year after our first meeting in the Paris restaurant, which has so many pleasant memories for us, Drew completed his first one hundred hours of flight over the lines, an event in the life of an airman which calls for a celebration of some sort. Therefore, having been granted leave for the afternoon, the two of us came into the old French town of bar le duc by the toy train which wanders down from the Verdun sector. We had dinner in one of those homelike little places where the food is served by the proprietor himself. On this occasion, 
It was served hurriedly, and the bill presented promptly at eight o'clock. Our host was very sorry, but the sales boches vont servir, messieurs. They had come the night before, a dozen houses destroyed, women and children killed and maimed. With a full moon to guide them, they would be sure to return to-night. A cette guerre quad sacré fine. He offered us a refuge until our train should leave. Usually, he said, he played solitaire while waiting for the Germans, but with houses tumbling about one's ears, he much preferred company, and my wife and I are old people. She is very deaf. Here is She hears nothing. J.B. declined the invitation. A brave way that would be to finish our evening, he said as we walked down the silent street. I wanted to say, monsieur, I have just finished my first one hundred hours of flight at the front, but he wouldn't have known what that means. I said, no, he wouldn't have known. Then we had no further talk for about two hours. A few soldiers, late arrivals, were prowling about in the shadow of the houses, searching for food and a warm kitchen where they might eat it. Some insistent ones pounded on the door of a restaurant far in the distance. That's donc patron, noif avon fame, mon de du. Escalate tout his mons est mortsi. Only a host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men. It was that kind of silence, profound, tense, ghost-like. We walked through street after street from one end of the town to the other, and saw only one light, a faint glimmer, which came from a slit of a cellar window, almost on the level of the pavement. We were curious, no doubt. At any rate, we looked in. A woman was sitting on a cot bed, with her arms around two little children. They were snuggled up against her, and both fast asleep. But she was sitting very erect, in a strained, listening attitude, staring straight before her. Since that night we have believed, both of us, that if wars can be won only by haphazard night bombardments of towns where there are women and children, then they had far better be lost. But I am writing a journal of high adventure, of a cleaner kind, in which all the resources in skill and cleverness of one set of men are pitted against those of another set. We have no bomb dropping to do, and there are but few women and children living in the territory over which we fly. One hundred hours is not a great while, as time is measured on the ground, but in terms of combat patrols, the one hundredth part of it has held more of an adventure in the true meaning of the word than we have had during the whole of our lives previously. At first we were far too busy learning the rudiments of combat to keep an accurate record of flying time. We thought our aeroplane clocks convenient pieces of equipment, rather than necessary ones. I remember coming down from my first air battle, and the breathless account I gave of it, at the bureau breathless and vague. Lieutenant Talbot listened quietly, making out the Comte de Rendu as I talked. When I had finished, he emphasized the haziness of my answers to his questions by quoting them, Region, you know, that big wood, time, this morning, of course, rounds fired, oh, a lot, etc. Not until we had been flying for a month or more did we learn how to make the right use of our clocks and of our eyes while in the air. We listened with amazement to the after-patrol talk at the mess. We learned more of what actually happened on our sorties after they were over than while they were in progress. All of the older pilots missed seeing nothing, which there was to see. They reported the numbers of the enemy planes encountered, the type, where seen and when. They spotted batteries, trains, and stations back of the enemy lines, gave the hour precisely, reported any activity on the roads. In moments of exasperation, Drew would say, I think they are stringing us. This is all a put-up job. Certainly this did appear to be the case at first, for we were air-blind. We saw little of the activity all around us, and details on the ground had no significance. How were we to take thought of time and place and altitude, note the peculiarities of enemy machines, count their numbers, and store all this information away in memory at the moment of combat? This was a great problem. What I need, J.B. used to say, is a traveling private secretary. I'll do the fighting, and he can keep the diary. 
I needed one, too, a man air-wise and battle-wise, who could calmly take note of my clock, altimeter, temperature, and pressure dials, identify exactly the locality on my map, count the numbers of the enemy, estimate their approximate altitude, all this, when the air was crisscrossed with streamers of smoke from machine-gun tracer bullets and opposing aircraft were maneuvering for position, diving and firing at each other, spiraling, nose-spinning, wing-slipping, climbing in a confusing intermingling of tricolored cocards and black crosses. We made gradual progress, the result being that our patrols became a hundredfold more fascinating, sometimes, in fact, too much so. It was important that we should be able to read the ground, but more important still to remember that what was happening there was only of secondary concern to us. Often we became absorbed in watching what was taking place below us, to the exclusion of any thought of aerial activity, our chances for attack or of being attacked, the view from the air of a heavy bombardment or of an infantry attack under cover of barrage fires is a truly terrible spectacle, and in the air one has a feeling of detachment which is not easily overcome. Yet it must be overcome, as I have said, and cannot say too many times for the benefit of any young airman who may read this journal. During an offensive the air swarms with planes. They are at all altitudes, from the lowest artillery reagage machines to a few hundreds of meters, to the highest avions de chase at six thousand meters and above. Reglage, photographic, and reconnaissance planes have their particular work to do. They defend themselves as best they can, but almost never attack. Combat avions, on the other hand, are always looking for victims. They are the ones chiefly dangerous to the unwary pursuit pilot. Drew's first official victory came as the result of a one-sided battle with an albatross single-seater, whose pilot evidently did not know there was an enemy within miles of him. No more did J.B. for that matter. It was pure accident, he told me afterward. He had gone from Reims to the Argonne Forest without meeting a single German, and I didn't want to meet one, for it was Thanksgiving Day. It has associations for me, you know. I'm a New Englander. It is not possible to convince him that it has any real significance for men who were not born on the North Atlantic seaboard. Well, all the way he had been humming, Over the river and through the woods to grandfather's house we go. To himself, it is easy to understand why he didn't want to meet a German. He must have been in a curiously mixed frame of mind. He covered the sector again and passed over Reims, going northeast. Then he saw the albatross, and if you had been standing on one of the towers of the cathedral, you would have seen a very unequal battle. The German was about two kilometers inside his own lines, and at least a thousand meters below. Drew had every advantage. He didn't see me until I opened fire, and then, as it happened, it was too late. My gun didn't jam. The German started falling out of control, Drew following him down until he lost sight of him in making a voyage. I leaned against the canvas wall of a hangar, registering incredulity. Three times out of seven to make a conservative estimate, we fight inconclusive battles because of faulty machine guns or defective ammunition. The ammunition, most of it that is bad, comes from America. While Drew was giving me the details, an orderly from the Bureau brought word that an enemy machine had just been reported shot down on our sector. It was Drew's albatross. But he nearly lost official credit for having destroyed it because he did not know exactly the hour when the combat occurred. His watch was broken, and he had neglected asking for another before starting. He judged the time of the attack approximately as 2.30, and the infantry observers reporting the result gave it as twenty minutes to three. The region in both cases coincided exactly, however, and fortunately, Drew's was the only combat which had taken place in that vicinity during the afternoon. For an hour after his return he was very happy. He had won his first victory, always the hardest to gain, and had been complimented by the commandant, by Lieutenant Nugrasser, the Roy de Aces and by other French and American pilots. There is no petty jealousy among airmen. And in our group, the esprit de corps is unusually fine. 
Rivalry is keen, but each squadron takes almost as much pride in the work of the other squadrons as it does in its own. The details of the result were horrible. The albatross broke up two thousand meters from the ground. One wing, falling within the French lines. Drew knew what it meant to be wounded and falling out of control, but his spad held together. He had a chance for his life. Supposing the German to have been merely wounded, an airman's joy in victory is a short-lived one. Nevertheless, a curious change takes place in his attitudes towards his work as the months pass. I can best describe it in terms of Drew's experience and my own. We came to the front feeling deeply sorry for ourselves and for all airmen of whatever nationality whose lives were to be snuffed out in their promising beginnings. I used to play The Minstrel Boy to War Has Gone on a tin flute, and Drew wrote poetry. While we were waiting for our first machine, he composed the airman's rendezvous, written in the manner of Alan Seeger's poem. And I in the wide fields of air must keep with him my rendezvous. It may be I shall meet him there when clouds like sheep move slowly through the pathless meadows of the sky, and their cool shadows go beneath. I have a rendezvous with death some summer noon of white and blue. There is more of it in the same manner, all of which he read me in a husky voice. I, too, was ready to weep at our untimely fate. The strange thing is that his prophecy came so very near being true. He had the first draft of the poem in his breast pocket when wounded, and has kept the gory relic to remind him, not that he needs reminding, of the airy manner in which he cancelled what ought to have been a bona fide appointment. I do not mean to reflect in any way upon Alan Seeger's beautiful poem. Who can doubt that it is a sincere as well as a perfect expression of a mood common to all young soldiers? Drew was just as sincere in writing his verses, and I put all the feeling I could into my tin whistle interpretation of the minstrel boy. What I want to make clear is that a soldier's moods of self-pity are fleeting ones, and if he lives, he outgrows them. Imagination is an especial curse to an airman, particularly if it takes a gloomy or morbid turn. We used to write, to whom it may concern, letters before going out on patrol, in which we left directions for the notification of our relatives and the disposal of our personal effects in case of death. Then we would climb into our machines, thinking, this may be our last sortie. We may be dead in an hour, in half an hour, in twenty minutes. We planned splendidly spectacular ways in which we were to be brought down, always omitting one, however, the most horrible as well as the most common, in flames. Thank fortune we have outgrown this second and belated period of adolescence, and can now take a healthy interest in our work. Now an inevitable part of the daily routine is to be shelled, persistently, methodically, and often accurately shelled. Our interest in this may, I suppose, be called healthy, inasmuch as it would be decidedly unhealthy to become indifferent to the activities of the German anti-aircraft gunners. It would be far-fetched to say that any airman ever looks forward zestfully to the business of being shot at with one hundred and fives and seventy-fives if they are well placed, are unpleasant enough. After one hundred hours of it, we have learned to assume that attitude of contemptuous toleration, which is the manner common to all pilots de chase. We know that the chances of a direct hit are almost negligible, and that we have the blue dome of the heavens in which to maneuver. Furthermore, we have learned many little tricks by means of which we can keep the gunners guessing. By way of illustration, we are patrolling, let us say, at 3,500 meters, crossing and recrossing the lines, following the patrol leader who has his motor throttled down so that we may keep well in formation. The guns may be silent for the moment, but we know well enough what the gunners are doing. We know exactly where some of the batteries are, and the approximate location of all of them along the sector, and we know from earlier experience when we come within range of each individual battery. Presently, one of them begins firing in bursts of four shells. If their first estimate of our range has been an accurate one, if they place them uncomfortably close, so that we can hear all too well above the roar of the motors, 
the rendering grum grum of the shells as they explode we sail calmly to all outward appearances on maneuvering very little the gunners seeing that we are not disturbed will alter the ranges four times out of five which is exactly what we want them to do the next burst will be hundreds of meters below or above us whereupon we show signs of great uneasiness and the gunners thinking they have our altitude begin to fire like demons we employ our well-earned impunity in preparing for the next series of battles or in thinking of the cost to germany at one hundred francs a shot of all this futile shelling drew in particular loves this cost accounting business and i must admit that much pleasure may be had in it after patrol they rarely fire less than fifty shells at us during a two-hour patrol making a low general average the number is near one hundred and fifty in our present front where aerial activity is fairly brisk and the sector is a large one three or four hundred shells are wasted upon us often before we have been out an hour we have memories of all the good batteries from flanders to the vosage mountains battery after battery we make their acquaintance along the entire sector whenever we go many of them of course are mobile so that we never lose the sport of searching for them only a few days ago we located one of this kind which came into action in the open by the side of the road first we saw the flashes and then the shell bursts in the same cadence we tipped up and fired at him in bursts of twenty to thirty rounds which is the only way airmen have of passing the time of day with their friends the enemy anti-aircraft gunners who ignore the art of camouflage but we can converse with them after a fashion even though we do not know their exact position it will be long before this chapter of my journal is in print having given no indication of the date of writing i may say without indiscretion that we are again on the champagne front we have a wholesome respect for one battery here a respect it has justly earned by shooting which is really remarkable we talk of this battery which is east of rheims and not far distant from nagent la base and take professional pride in keeping its gunners in ignorance of their fine marksmanship we signal them their bad shots which are better than the good ones of most of the batteries on the sector by doing stunts a barrel turn a loop two or three turns of a ural as for their good shots they are often so very good that we are forced into acrobacy of a wholly individual kind our avions have received many scars from their shells between forty five hundred and five thousand meters their bursts have been so close under us that we have been lifted by the concussions and set down violently again at the bottom of the vacuum and this on a clear day when the chase machine is almost invisible at that height and despite its speed of two hundred kilometers an hour on a gray day when we are flying between twenty five hundred and three thousand meters beneath a film of cloud they repay the honor we do them by our acrobatic turns they bracket us put barrages between us and our own lines give us more trouble than all the other batteries on the sector combined for this reason it is all the more humiliating to be forced to land with motor trouble just at the moment when they are paying off some old scores this happened to drew while i have been writing up my journal coming out of a tonneau in answer to three coups from the battery his propeller stopped dead by planing flatly the wind was dead ahead and the area back of the first lines there is a wide one crossed by many intersecting lines of trenches he got well over them and chose a field as level as a billiard table for landing ground in the very center of it however there was one post a small worm-eaten thing of the color of the dead grass around it he hit it just as he was setting his spad on the ground the only post in a field acres wide and it tore a piece of fabric from one of his lower wings no doubt the crack battery has been given credit for disabling an enemy plane the honor such as it is belongs to our aerial godfather among whose lesser vices may be included that of practical joking the remnants of the post were immediately confiscated for firewood by some poilois who were living in a dugout nearby. End of chapter 8